Welcome to Walklings, a podcast about art, creativity and nature. I'm your host, Lucia Para, Italian artist, illustrator and children educator with the Reggio Emilia approach. And in this season, I talk with inspirational creatives who grow the arts, with children and young people. Welcome. Welcome to the second episode of Oaklings. Today's interview feels like a real gift, so much so that when I sat down to edit it, I was so interested in our conversation that I forgot all about the editing and I started to listen to it again. Martin Pace has been working in the landscape of children for about 30 years and in 2006 he founded Reflections a nursery and small school in the south of the UK. Awarded four times as outstanding from Ofsted, which is the UK office for standard in education, it was a real jewel and inspiration for so many educators and a real gift for the children and families who experienced it. Reflections had a Reggio Emilia approach at its core, which is also the cultural landscape where I grew up. And talking about it lit up in me lots of passion and enthusiasm, as you will hear. Martin has led professional development days at Reflections for over 10 years, and they were attended by over 6,000 people from 16 different countries, And of course, he himself had done several study tours in Reggio Emilia. This conversation has also some visuals because Martin shows us some of the books he published while at Reflections and also he shared with us some snippets of the life at the school. So I invite you to check out the YouTube version of our interview. And at the present time, the love for nature that Martin shared for so many years with the young ones led him to live with nature in a beautiful farm. But his journey in service of children and education might follow him along in this new life. So I invite you to listen to our conversation and I truly hope you will enjoy it. Hi Martin, welcome to Oaklings. Thank you very much, Lucia. Thank you. Um, Buongiorno. <laughs> that you asked me. It's very kind. <laughs> yes, I know I can speak a little bit of Italian with you. Uh, yeah, only a little, though. Only a little. Otherwise, we'll get lost, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. So I normally like to start my podcast by telling the listeners how I came to know about my guests. So if you don't mind, um, I'll tell them how I get to know about you. Please go ahead. Thank you. So that was through a common friend, uh, artist, Teresa Grimaldi, and she lives on the Isle of Wight, where I live now. But one day when I met her, she was telling me of when she used to be an atelierista, which is maybe a word we're going to talk a little bit about later. And uh, in this nursery in the south of England and all the wonderful things she she's a very (laughs) highly creative soul and all these wonderful things she made with the children and also she showed me some of the books and she gifted me which i have here to show later for the people that watch the video version some of the books you made with the children and knowing that i'm an illustrator and a bookworm and you know i i love stories then you got my art very easily (laughs) And, (laughs) and then when i thought about making this podcast you were one of the first people i thought oh i need to interview martin That's very, very sweet. Thank you. So, yeah, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit, a little bit about you, uh, what you do and how the journey of working for children started for you. Sure. Um, so I was the founder and um, director at Reflections. Um, Reflections is a, a nursery on the south coast in, in Worthing in, East, in West Sussex. Um, and initially, we acquired an existing nursery, which was uh, in 2006, uh, which had about 50 staff and about 100 children. Um, over time, we developed the nursery uh, and changed the way in which the pedagogy and the curriculum, uh, the curricular approach worked. 
and then bought the building next door and developed that into a nursery and then a, a, an additional part of the nursery and a very small infant school. So by the end of our journey, um, when we sold the nursery in 2019, we had about 170 children in the nursery and about 24 children in the, in the uh, small school. So it was a very, very small school for children from five to eight years old. But the nursery took children from naught to fives. Uh, we had a team of about 65 staff. So it was, although it was a single nursery, it was a pretty big operation. Um, we, um, we drew inspiration from Reggio Emilia, uh, which I'm, I know we're going to talk a lot about, uh, but Reggio Emilia is a city in northern, uh, northern Italy. If you haven't heard of Reggio, please look it up. Uh, it's the most amazing uh, experience. Um, I have been there uh, about 12 times on study tour since 2002, uh, and we took around 30 staff to visit there on study tour and draw inspiration from their approach. In Reggio, they will tell you many, many times, it's not a method, it's not a model, it's not like Montessori or Steiner that you can take from a book. Uh, it's very much an approach. Um, and that approach they describe, it's based on incessant research and action. And I think that has been the story of the last 15 years from 2006 to 2021, which was my time with Reflections. Um, that's been the story of that, of, of that 15 years, incessant research and action. And again, in, Re in Reggio, they talk about a chorus of many intelligences, that's adults and children working together to create the curriculum themselves. And again, that's very much been the story of, of our approach at Reflections. Um, and it's been quite a journey. So, yeah. And how did you know at first about Reggio Emilia? So I met two wonderful people who were also co-founders and directors in Reflections um, called Pat Brunton and Linda Thornton. And I met them in around 2000. They were touring the country, presenting about their experience of having attended study, uh, study groups in Reggio. They'd written a book, sort of beginning to distill the important elements of Reggio and to share that and disseminate that in the UK. And I, we fell in love with each other and we, um, we, we, we worked together on, uh, on the beginnings of Reflections. And they were with us for the first two years to help me really get it established and set up. Yes. Um, so they introduced me to Reggio. I'd heard of Reggio when I very first started working with children in you know, 1996. Um, and they had done the, uh, the international tour, A uh, Hundred Languages of Learning, The Hundred Languages. And it was, uh, I, hadn't, I hadn't read much about it, but I'd managed to get hold of the catalogue um, from the exhibition, the 100 Languages exhibition. And I was already inspired at that point. And then I saw their first exhibition in Cambridge with Pat, Pat Brunton and Linda Thornton um, and a team, of, uh, a team of people that I'd started working with at the time uh, in childcare. Um, and obviously I was, you know, I was excited and inspired and, you know, and frankly blown away. I, so one of the reasons I work with children is because when I was growing up in the UK, there used to be an expression, children should be seen and not heard. And for me, when I heard that, those words as a child, I, I instantly lost respect for the adult. I, I just thought, You're, why aren't you choosing to engage with me as a child? I'm, you know, I have... You know, I have things to do and say, you know, I, 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 so, so this sort of quietening down of the child's voice for me was um, deeply insulting, I think, uh, for children. And when I finally discovered Reggio, I really felt like I'd come home because they valued the child's voice so, you know, so intrinsically. It was just part of their DNA and celebrated the child. And through their work, you could really begin to open a window into this 
sort of incredible experience that we call childhood. And I, you know, for me, I felt that window had been opened when I went to Reggie. I see. Yeah, it might be interesting to tell the listeners how I came to know about Reggio because funnily enough, I'm Italian and I come from probably 100 miles away from Reggio. And uh, when I was a student in infant school, uh, nursery and primary school, we used to do a lot of creative things, especially in primary school, because, of course, our motor skills were more, you know, um, fine. And so we did a lot of project about theatre, movement. Mm -hmm painting and uh, the teacher invited uh, the scenographers from Bologna Fine Arts Academy to work with us and build the stage of our play. So we used to work in collaboration with them really, really close. We were using their tools, which for us were mind blowing because I remember there was this kind of chainsaw that with heat would uh, mod model um, big pieces of polystyrene. Wow. That were making into rocks and for us it was a dangerous tool but we were allowed to use it with them <laughs> things like that and making like plaster casting to make make masks to use you know for the play all of these things and yeah. uh, but when I was there I didn't know that there was anything to do with the Reggio Emilia approach and even more funnily I studied my high school for becoming a primary teacher and we studied Frebel, Pestalozzi, we studied all Sure. And study about radio. This Incredible. is really strange. And then yeah, when I came, in, yeah, when I came into the UK and I got a grant to do my early years training in university, and the people from the university um, called me because they saw the video I was making for children, and they said, "Oh, sure, but you are you are an atelierista," and I said, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> and then you know I went home I didn't I didn't tell I didn't know anything about it but I went home and started researching about that and it, it was like as you said it was coming home everything I did made sense if you look it through the sure. lens of that approach yeah absolutely. and then made me understand that perhaps what had happened is that the you know method or schools influence each other the the regions you know, the teachers talk to each other. And that was the way that we used to do schools. Yeah. Uh, it was just yeah. the way. And then there's this other thing that in Italy, we say a lot that important things in Italy don't get re very much recognized. Even single artists or scientists often have to go abroad in order yes. to get things going. <laughs> yeah. That's very sad in a way, isn't it? <laughs> I think for That's, me, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but anyway, this I think is a really funny story how I came yes. to know about Rachel because it wasn't in Italy. No, that's so crazy. Yeah, absolutely yeah. crazy. Yeah. And so when when you were in reflections, yeah. your role was uh, I kind I kind of understand was not so much to be the teacher or the educator, but more, that's right. more like to be the glue of the of the magic it was, it, it was exactly that i mean i you know my skills as a, as an educator weren't the best skills i had and certainly i was nowhere near as good as many of the educators that we had i tended to work directly with children in the forest um and i started our our forest school program in 2009 um and and you know this was it, the being in nature was very important to me, but it was very important to, to make sure that the children had really deep connections with nature. Um, and we then later took, went on to do beach school in about 2013, 14. Um, but I my role was I, first of all I was you know I was responsible for marrying these two interesting sides of the same coin, which was the organisation and pedagogy. And to make sure that 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 there was a lovely balance between the two, that we were never never sacrificing one thing for the other, and by that I mean ensuring that pedagogy could, was had the opportunity to be at its very best, but at the same time that the the the, the nursery as a business was also sustainable. It was going to be able to con continue rather than. Pedagogy was wonderful for two years, and then we all went bankrupt, or you know, yeah, that sort of that sort of thing. So that was a that's a, an interesting balancing act to manage. But I also think my role was one of holding on to the vision, holding on to 
the importance of what we were doing, valuing children and children's voices and respect, respect for each other, respect for the children, respect for the parents and respect for each other as educators. Um, and, and also um, just, just ending up facilitating teams, groups of people who would work together successfully. And sometimes that takes a real, um, it's a, you know, it's, it, there is some skill involved, but it's a real balancing act again, between, you know, making sure that individuals have their real opportunity to express themselves, but at the same time, ensure that collaboration is key. Collaboration is the critical thing. Our whole curricular approach was developed through taking time out, meeting, discussing, sharing observations and listening to each other's, uh, each other's views of what we may have seen in, a, in, a, in any particular room, in, at any particular group of children or any one child. And that takes real time. And that's also a financial investment. So to get a group of six or eight people together during the, a busy working day, sharing views, talking, discussing, planning, and taking and making next steps, reflecting on, on the discussion, documenting that those discussions and, and, and the work that they're doing with the children. All of that is a, a deliberate investment in the creation of our own pedagogy. And I acknowledge that that was a little bit of a luxury to have when we had it, but it was an important thing to ensure that the quality was there. Yeah, there's uh, so many interesting things. First of all, I can see that the fact of having a vision is probably the key for making something last, a project last. Yeah. And sometimes it takes some, of course, everybody needs to be involved and passionate, but I think the skill of keeping this vision alive is very much important for things to flow and evolve in a positive yeah. way. So yes. this is my first thought, but also you were talking, uh, I often ask how, what, where is the trick of keeping the high quality of experience together with the very low, sometimes non-existing budget that we as <laughs> students have? And you were talking a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, look, I, you know, I'm, I think one of the tricks here and I know we are talking from a position of privilege because we made a big investment in the nursery. We deliberately set out not to be big, but to be good. We wanted, for the sake of the children, we wanted a place of excellence. And we wanted to demonstrate that excellence could happen within the culture of childcare and education in the UK. We'd, we had seen that excellence could happen in Reggio Emilia. I mean, there are 55, 60 uh, infant toddler centers and preschools in Reggio Emilia, and every one of them is excellent. Every one of them is excellent. There are some that are utterly mind blowing, uh, and they're all mind blowing at different points in time, but every one of them is excellent. What I wanted to do was set out a, a, a journey for a group of people collaborating together on a scale that was manageable to do the very best we could within the context of the UK system and within the context of UK culture. So for example, and I'm going off point and I promise to come back to answer your question, but one of the big differences between, for example, Reggio and the UK is that in Reggio preschools, everybody starts in September. They all arrive at nine o'clock. They potentially can finish at sort of four o'clock in the afternoon and without or four thirty, and then there's an additional time when extra staff will come in and do what they call tempo lungo until maybe six o'clock. But the day is really nine till four or four thirty with an hour for lunch, and so and 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 those and it's twenty six children with two teachers in a space, and they are regularly there all the time. And sometimes those teachers, if it's usual for those two teachers to see that group of children all the way through a three year period. So from three until six years old. In the UK, with the same age group, say three to five year olds, we would have 50 or 60 or 70 children in any one week because the majority of children will be doing part time sessions. 
So they might do a Monday, a Thursday, and a Friday morning. And then there would be other children doing Monday afternoons and Thursday afternoons and Wednesday mornings. So we had to juggle this huge group of children in the context of recreating learning groups and working together on a particular project. We would have to juggle those, those large groups, where, whereas Reggio would have a much, a much more cohesive approach. And we found that you know, pretty challenging, to be honest with you. But without doing that, it wouldn't have been financially sustainable. We couldn't have said to everybody, right, you start at the nursery in September. And if you, if you're not, if you, you know, if you want a place in April, you've got to wait for them. We, we couldn't have done that. And we couldn't have said to working parents, I know that it's very nice to, you know, to see your children uh, when you're not working, but we want your children at five days a week. We couldn't have done that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in answer to your question, how do you marry this sort of the, the quality with, with, with budget? There is a virtuous circle. If you're doing something really well and people can see that and people value it, then you can charge a little more. We were never the most expensive nursery in Worthing, but we were usually the second most expensive nursery. And, it, and we, we, we were able to charge something of a premium for our services so that we, so that we could use that money and use that to have to overstaff deliberately so that we could give staff non-contact time for preparation for meetings for planning and for preparing their spaces that delivers quality which means that you can sustain the price so when we set out to be to be really really good at what we did we knew we were also going to have to charge for that we didn't want to be an elitist organization. We didn't want people to walk up to the nursery and not feel they could afford us. But we did have to charge the majority of the users who use the nursery. We did have to charge them at the top end of the scale. But we also provided places on through the government schemes to make sure that it was accessible to all if we could. Yes, this uh, again is really, really interesting. One of the things is that now I'm rereading the book, The Hundred Languages of Children, that has been republished and a little bit updated from the original version from by Malaguzzi, which is the founder of the Radio Approach. And one of the things I remember is that they talk about the fact that Radio Emilia approach cannot be the same everywhere because radio is one place in the world and so even in their vision this kind of adaptation to the culture and situation and context it was actually part of what what they thought would make a school successful and any other thing you made me think of is that when you were talking about the teacher sharing the visions and allowing time and financial investment for that it made me think that after all, if you want to give expression to the children, you need to enable the adults' expression and communication and creativity as well. So yeah. in, in a different way than the adults, you know, just going over the children telling them what to do, but in, at the same in the same weight. Yes, exactly. I mean, we what we talk about is I mean, we, one of the things that we instantly drew from Reggio was this really strong image of the child. And Malaguzzi talks about the image of the child as being strong, powerful, capable, competent, beautiful, um, but with a huge desire and eagerness for learning. And, and, and what he talks about when he, when, he, when he talks about that image of the child is that this is the image of the child that as adults we need to hold. This is our, our connection with, with doing something that's potentially self-fulfilling, that if this is the way we treat children, then that's how they're likely to respond. And in the context of that, it, you know, we, we also need to expect the very, very best from, our, from the adults, from the educators working with, with those children. We want the, the adult educators to be strong, powerful, capable, competent. We want them to have pride in their work. We want them to be able to find the creative spirit inside themselves that sometimes gets crushed in childhood, refine that creative spirit and bring that into the classroom, which is one of the reasons why we worked with so many artists. You know, 
Picasso, I'm sure it's, it's, a, it's a very well quoted quote, but you know, Picasso talks about all children are artists. The trick is being able to hold on to being to, to hold on to that as you as you grow up. But artists do tend to manage those hold that holding on to that creative spirit, which is why we chose to work with artists. And they will bring that to the classroom every time, which is, you know, is very, very exciting. The, the sort of the, the best years in in reflections years were you know in terms of when we were really motoring well and developing well and staff were really gelling as a team was maybe between say 2014 and 2019 2020 2019 and we and we had a a team of six artists we had a fantastic pedagogista called Deb Walensky it was never plain sailing because it's really hard work and, and, and everyone is really passionate and committed. But we, were, we had this fantastic collegiality where we were all collaborating and listening to each other and working well when it was going well. And, and you know, that takes, um, it, it took the artists and the educators who were inspired by the artists quite frequently as well to all come together and create that learning environment for each other, which then which then fed into into fantastic project work with the children. So let's talk about a little bit about this role of the artist in the school, because yes. I think some of the people that are not familiar with the radio approach will find this a little bit strange and mind blowing that we have an artist and also which artist, because you know there can be many type of sure. fields of art. So what are these artists doing in the school? So it's really interesting. When um, when I very first visited Reggio, um, I was running a different nursery company um, uh, in London, and we invited an artist to work with the children. And she came into the nursery. She was a very sweet person. She was very nice. She was a very good artist. And she came in and she did her art. And the children sort of had were, were basically like a group of helpers, a group of runners for her while she was doing her art. And I sort of said, you know, actually, this is absolutely what we don't want. We don't want an artist coming in and doing their art. What we want is someone coming in and observing, seeing, listening to the children, creating connections between what they're seeing in a group of children, and then bringing in some provocations, some ideas, some, some challenges for the children within the context of what they are particularly interested in at the time. So, and this is really how a project works. A project might begin with a child's idea or an adult provocation. The children will tend to get very excited about this or very interested in it as a group. There will be a, a research question perhaps or that, that, that a child or an adult may have initiated, but the children will then engage with this very, very powerfully. They, they will often talk about it as their work. And, and all, you know, there's a lot of discussion around the value of play with children, um, but children will often talk about their, their play as work. And, and so we hear the children engaged really, really powerfully in deep and meaningful work uh, and the artist's role is to ensure that, that the trajectory of that remains exciting, that the children are, are brought into it if they are as individuals, if they're not necessarily, if they can't see a way in. Um, and that uh, e each child is valued within the context of, of, of the work. Um, and uh, and that you know and that a, a, there's a sort of beginning of a of a framework that could be that be, could be created into something that the children may 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 see as as an umbrella. You know, the point about a project is it's an adult term. The children don't necessarily think we're working on a project. They're just really deeply engaged. And so what we look for is is the big idea that might be underpinning their work. And then we can represent that idea to them and, and re-challenge them with those, with those ideas, with the big idea, and see and see and re and hear their reinterpretation. And that's and, and the artist's role in that is absolutely critical. And it's the artist or the educator's role, but the artist tends to bring in lovely ref, lovely points of reference. 
points of reference from other art, uh, exciting artworks that are valued internationally that might be mirroring or challenging exactly what the children are thinking and doing at the time. So I kind of think that a good project, let's call it like that, for just for now to understand what we're talking about, need to be slightly open-ended in it in its essence because the it's children completely should... open-ended, completely open. So it to... needs to be broad. Never we would, we only map a project in retrospect. We only know where the project has been. We don't know where the project is going. So can give us a 90% 90, 90 of the time. And and if we and if and if and the other 10%, it might be just because we have an idea in mind of uh, of of something that we deliberately wanted to set out to engage the children and and see their responses in. But the other 90% of the time, the, the project is going is is going in a direction that the children are determining. Now, that doesn't mean it goes in, if you're grouping, working with a group of 12, it goes in 12 different directions uh, or, that it, or that it goes in 12 different directions and fizzles out. The, the adult role is to try and weave some of those strands together into something that is cohesive and identifiable and shared between the group of, the, between the group of children. It's an art. And when you see it in action, I th the, the, the best way is to give examples of the work. And, you know, we would need a couple of hours, I think. But, but, the, but it's an art. And when you see it in action, it's quite astonishing over a period of time. Yeah, because this is the other thing that uh, is somehow is characteristic of the radio approach that generally projects have uh, a longer period of time. I mean, when I was a student, we had the project. It was a year long. It could have been water. It could have been the season. It could have been the city. And when I was older, it was a book, like the never-ending story, for example. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to show you this. This is one of our, the very first project book we ever printed. Oh, no way. That's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the same. Ah. <laughs> That's good. That's really weird. <laughs> This, this particular page, it's probably backwards on my screen. This particular page is, is, is um, one of the most important things for us. So this was a sort of a way of defining how the, um, how the trajectory of a project would go. We only ever plan maybe um, two weeks in advance. And what we're planning is sessions, materials, and space and often the, the scale. So are we going to work outside? Are we going to work on a, or inside? Are we going to work on a small scale or are we going to work on a large scale? What materials do we, do we need to bring into, the, bring into the space? And then we can observe the children and see where they, take, where they take those materials in that space at that time. And how long a project roughly would last? Uh, it could last anything from three months to a year. Um, depending on uh, depending on the work, and the only reason I say a year is because of the way in which the the, the school year works. We tend to sort of see uh, uh, you know, uh, classrooms and children change at about once a year, normally in September. So it sort of mirrors the school year. Mm -hmm. So within a scholastic year, I mean, I have seen projects that have continued on between different groups. Uh, there was a beautiful piece of work that Teresa did uh, all around just children being with birds. You must talk to Teresa, to Teresa about it. It gave rise to all sorts of films and work and also including a book called Homely. Um, and, uh, and it lasted, it didn't just last a year because children were always wanting to engage with birds. And we, we created, they, they created their own museum and then we took the museum out into a funny little um, uh, caravan in the garden that Teresa bought. And then we put it all in the garden and the children carried on engaging with it. So it's almost like the, the project sort of went on and on and on. The um, Luna Park. Very of, powerful thing. Yeah. The, um, there is a project that Malaguzzi did that he, he went to a touring around the world and it was called the Fanfare of Birds. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that was. I mean, that was the one of the 
the yeah the the um the projects that I connected with most immediately when I first went to Reggio yeah the amusement park for the birds yes exactly. yeah so I wonder now can we talk a little bit about these books because yeah. <laughs> you know I mean look at this if you are watching the the video version hardback ISBN, this could easily be sold in a bookshop and probably is, I guess. You can get it on Amazon. <laughs> you, can. you can get it on Amazon as well. And the quality of these books inside, I mean, now I probably can't show you all, but it, it is like, you know, a real picture book made by an adult illustrator. I mean, not the, not the type of images, perhaps, but the design, the layout, the thought about you know type and fonts and uh, if you don't mind i would like to say a few yeah, uh, sure. sentences about this this yeah. is called storing and it talks a little bit about how children make up stories and in one page uh, <laughs> the beginning we have the beginnings and just <laughs> few of this i mean this is a uh, quoted uh, the sentences of the children which are i think between three three and five yeah something like that yeah. And they say something like how a story begins. It all began of once upon a time. <laughs> and once up there, you know, if you need ideas for your stories, I yeah. am the story writers here. <laughs> and then this, we won't begin until the words are done. Clearly. <laughs> I love this. And, uh, you know, you need to be able to listen to capture these, isn't it? That's absolutely right. And I, you know, in, in, in Reggio, they, they talk about a pedagogy of listening. Um, and we wanted, so each year, um, all the time, projects are going on in all the spaces. Every single, every single space will have a project in, and it will be uh, overseen and supported by an educator or an artist in each one of the spaces. There are a handful of spaces where Projects won't necessarily happen like a construction room, although they could. But um, so projects are going on all the time. But what we also added into our approach was what we called a, an annual focus. And the idea behind the annual focus was, was really to ensure that as many of the languages of expression of the children were being supported as possible. So we began by looking at sculpture. Um, we, we looked at papier-mâché work, we looked at clay work, we looked at wire work. We then had a refocus on sculpture again, um, asking the children what they understood about sculpture and particularly taking them around the town so that they could get to know whatever sculptural opportunities there were within Worthing and use those as inspiration. We had another one, uh, another um, uh, annual focus on uh, mechanics or another annual focus on sound. But one of the most productive and exciting of the annual focuses was on um, storying. And what this really helped support in the adults was a real focus of listening to children. At the end of the year where we'd spent listening for children's stories, adults were much better at tuning in to really, really, really listening to children. And I think the best example of this was in um, with the group of two to two and a half year olds. They um, so we began the whole all the work throughout the whole nursery um, on storying as uh, listening for children's stories, not telling them stories, but listening for their story. And we had a meeting in a, a, of a couple of days in advance of all of this with with uh, the pedagogical group of the nursery, where we would, we would discuss exactly what sort of thing we were listening for, um, how short a story could be, what, what storying might look like in babies, what story might, storying, what, what children's stories you know, being told by babies or children's stories being told by three and four year olds and the differences. But the most exciting work, um, or the best example of this work, came from the two to two and a half year old. And there was one child in particular, a little girl called Etta, who was very, very quietly spoken. Um, 
But uh, Laura, who was working with the children in that room, really tuned in to what Etta was saying. And we began to listen, listen to these stories that Etta was saying. So she might be drawing, but she would be telling a story at the same time. Or she might just be making modeling with clay, but she would be telling a story at the same time. And we listened for Etta's stories. We wrote those down and we shared Etta's stories with the children. And it led to some really powerful work about um, it was it ended up being called the um, the revolutionary baby. Um, Etta, Etta had a tiny little brother called a baby brother called Solomon. And um, a, a lot of the storying is around Etta's, Etta's explanation of what a baby is, how we need to protect babies, what's good and bad. We introduced a one inch. This was Deb Wilensky's idea. Um, she used to carry a, a one inch baby in her purse. And she said, what would happen if we put it into the space? And so this one inch plastic baby went into the space and the children adopted this baby. They, they moved it around a sculptural space that they'd created. The baby went from good to bad. It was fed by monsters, kind monsters. And this was all, you know, it was a spectacular storytelling. And it was only after maybe six or seven months that we actually begin, began to tell stories back to the children that of things like Jack and the Beanstalk or, um, you know, stories that would relate to their experiences that they'd had in creating their own stories around these monstrous places with this tiny little baby. It's a very, very powerful piece of work and a real window into a into really young children's thinking and the complexity of that thinking there is a I, I won't bore you with it because um it and it always makes me cry when I read it so I'm not going to do that in front of everybody but um there's a poem at the end of the book um that Essa wrote and it talks about the uh, you know about it's it's almost in meta language where she's explaining that we talk about these stories, but are they real or aren't they real? It's so powerful and so and so clever, and and I think we, you know, we 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 miss out sometimes on really connecting with children by not listening to them in a really deep way. And this beautiful piece of work really helped us to connect with children and listen them much much better than we than we had done before, for sure. Yeah. Still so value in it for sure. And here is where I can see the power of documentation, which is another thing of radio approach, because if these books were, let's say that this book was never made, and this could have been a revelation for few of the educators that saw it or maybe shared it with their family and friends. And now, thanks to that, it can be an open window for everyone that can exactly. access this book. And I mean, we don't think about two years old as storytellers. That we just think, oh, they just started to talk. But we, no. can, thanks to these witnessing, like uh, you know, documentation books, we can actually understand even more about them in terms of our science in a way. But if yeah. we don't probably need that, but if we wanted, we could use that. Yeah. Uh, we did some lovely work with the babies on this. They, they, we 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 just put up veils in a in a white room, and the children would be playing peepo and and you know and and telling the oldest story ever ever, which is I'm I'm not here, I am here. You know that just those those, but really in a very animated way, you could see them expressing story. What's lovely, by the way, about this about this the fire monster book was that. This was done at the same time. This was done by one of our educators um, who collated all the, all the children's stories and the children's pictures and put them together and just and, and made the book. And it was a, a, just a, a delightful piece of work. But um, this book is, is really written by two-year-olds and it really appeals to other two-year-olds. So it, as an adult, you might read this book and think, well, there's not that much in it. But, uh, but for two-year-olds, it's fascinating, and they get very, very excited about it. And that's what I love. I love the idea of children creating a book that excludes adults. That's fantastic for me. You know, this is their, in their own language. You know, it's just 
very exciting. You know, I've got a grandchild who loves this book. So. Yes, but I wonder from the point of view of the practicalities and being an illustrator, I'd be really curious about this, how these books actually happen, because I can picture a school where everybody is really busy doing what they are doing and who made the books then? So I this mean, is so so the artists and the educators got together and uh, usually overseen by the pedagogista. So that's Deb Wilensky again. Um, and um, and they had time. We set aside some time to design the books. Um, we then read, re, you know, rejig the design. We all we all read them and we all uh, we all benefited from reading them and, you know, and learned from each other by reading them. But uh, and then we sent them off to the printers and they got published. But but it was it's, it's all about time. It's about setting aside time for for those things to happen. And obviously, it's an investment. You know, a book costs a few thousand pounds. So, you know, just to print. So, uh, and then there's all the time that goes into the writing and the designing. But the principle behind the book, all of the books actually, is to ensure that children's voices are heard. So, although the narrative uh, is very important to us as adults because it sets the scene for what, for what, for what you're seeing as an adult reader, the important thing is that the children's voices so uh, is is heard the children's voice is heard through through each of those books and we had um two exhibitions in in worthing over the uh, you know two week long exhibitions in an art center there where we took all of this material our films our documentation um we made uh, about 200 different documentation panels all about the, the different project works, the different projects that we've done, and all of that appeared uh, in one exhibition, uh, two exhibitions in uh, in town. And for us, the importance there was having children's voices out in the community and having those those voices valued. And the mm -hmm. children saw that they could go and they could see themselves and their own work being valued in a in a big exhibition space with their families and with other adults walking around. Yeah, the impact of children in the community is another point of radio. And I, one of the, they used to do, I always think I'd love to do that one day, to bring the children in the market the, mm. during the week and, for example, draw portraits of the people passing by or, you know, what painting and doing their own art in front yeah. of people. And uh, in fact, my question now would be visually explained by if you think about, you know, the stone goes into the water and gives all these ripples. Operational, yes. Mm -hmm. And so my question would be about the parents, the families that were around and behind at home with the children. How do they got uh, impacted, influenced, involved in these, you know, school projects, in the learning of the children? I think, um, you know, it's all, you always get a sort of 50% of the parents will, will send their children to, to, to reflections because it was the most convenient nursery because it was just around the corner. But that we had a very strong group of parents who were real advocates for our work and were very excited about what we were doing. And that was always very welcome and very exciting. Um, we had people who moved from London to, to send their children to the to the to the school to to the nursery in Worthing, which was you know I mean I thought that was just mind blowing, but um, yeah it was it was we had a really good group of of parents who understood and got what we were trying to do. I think part of the issue for us is if you're if you're running a Montessori nursery or if you're running a Steiner nursery, you can be quite clear and explicit. Um, from the beginning about exactly what you're offering. When we began to talk about project work, artists, Reggio Emilia, working at forest school, beach school, there was a lot to explain. So what we did as a deliberate uh, you know, approach was we created a space in the, in the nursery where when parents were first settling in their children, we called it the cafe, and it was a cafe. We had a proper gadget Italian coffee machine. It was beautiful. It was, you know, it was all very cool. But we also had lots and lots of documentation in that space. So they could not escape what the children were doing in the nursery. We had a film showing all the time of a piece of project work. 
we had books on display, we had documentation panels in the space, and I would frequently go in there and, and talk. So it, these were, uh, this was a dedicated space to try and explain to parents our approach because it was complex. It wasn't, it wasn't simple to explain. And once I think we'd begun that process, uh, we, and we would really communicate what was going on in projects all the time with parents, monthly newsletter, lots of information going home, information on the, on the, on the door each day about what had happened in the project that day. That communication does begin to really engage parents. And, and a lot of the parents were quite creative themselves. They, some of them worked in creative industries. Some of them were teachers. And they could see the power of, 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 of what we were doing with their children. And I think that really helped. Yeah, in the school where I was learning, I remember the parents were always more or less involved in something going on. Either they were helping to make the clothes for the play that was going to happen. I mean, there was sure. a, a presence of the parents in the school. Yes, and that's lovely. And you see that in Reggio so much. I mean, they will have a parents meeting and it'll go on until midnight. You know, they're, they're deeply engaged. But I think there's a sense in the UK where, well, this is a service we're paying for. They can get on with that service. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I've got a busy job. And I really understand that as a working parent, you know, you, you, you're really, really, really busy. But some parents, I think, were quite excited by what we were doing and wanted to engage with that too. And, you, you know, we, so we had a very strong and active group of, of really engaged parents who, who wanted to support what we were doing. And would come in and you know, and so a, a guy you know came in and did a, a full day's DJing with the children to create a, a, and put a, a music track together for a video that the children had made about mycelia messages, messages between mushrooms in in the forest. Yeah, yeah, this is really interesting, and I like to believe I think I am a witness of that. The children that grow up in that environment somehow they are shaped in their lives not necessarily they have to become artists which i did because probably mm -hmm. i was impacted so strongly and maybe my personality blended very well with the making but i can see other children that grew, grew up with me and my sister when I, I have a younger sister so when she was in school then i helped the teacher so i kept being in that very <laughs> you know compost type of ideas yeah and I can see some of these grown ups now that even if they have different jobs, somebody can be even doctors or physiotherapists, but their quality of life, I think is different. They, they have uh, some kind of connection with beauty and yes. sometimes the vision of even when you go in their houses, you see what they decided to do with the furniture and the walls. <laughs> You understand the, yes. the impact, not necessarily in their jobs, but in the quality of their life. Yes, uh, is there. So Vea Vecchi talks. Uh, she's a, a very famous atelier Easter from the Diana School from many many years ago. Talks uh, about um, the aesthetic in in nurseries, and she said that no place could be too beautiful for children. And you know. I think that's absolutely true. But one of the reasons I think that's true is because I want children to know that their space is valued. This isn't, we're not putting them in, you know, in something that we don't care about. We're, we're, we're creating a space for them that they too can care about, that they can engage with and, and curate and create for themselves. But, but, but the beauty will be part of that, that, that the aesthetic will be part of that for, for them. And that, you know, we we operated from. I mean, I've run many many nurseries in my lifetime, but um, but the buildings that that Reflections are operated from were two beautiful old um, listed buildings. Not ne not necessarily everybody's cup of tea, but they were you know the the the, the high ceilings and chandeliers sometimes you know in in parts of the parts of the, the spaces. These were you know quite quite physically beautiful spaces. And we wanted that for, for the children. It was important. Yeah, so the children were actually helping you to shape the space, as I understand. Absolutely. And yeah, I would love to show you lots of photographs of children doing exactly that. The, the, you know, we, we think it's important for children to, 
So firstly, we say that all the spaces should be responding to the children's interest. So if, uh, if, uh, if children were interested in, um, in, let's say, color, then we would, we would begin that the year by dressing the room with color provocations for the children. It, the, the work may go in a different trajectory, but at least what we've done is we've started off with a child's, um, the children's interests in mind. Um, but that's the adults sort of creating the space and, and, and curating the space for the children in advance. What we also know is that, particularly when the children are three or four or five, they are able to author their own space. And we think that's really, really important. So that authorship of the space, when you see children creating the space for themselves, it's astonishing how, what they will do. We, 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 we have um, a, a beautiful piece of work done one by one of our educators called Kate Grant, um, supported again by Deb Walensky, and it was all around uh, gaming, creating small games and large scale games in a, in a space. And the children sort of amalgamated these games and just took over the whole floor of the whole room, created their own game. And it was so rich and so deep and so complex. There was, you know, there was mathematics, there was literacy, there was all sorts of things happening. I'll, I must send you a photograph. But, uh, but, but they created that space entirely. Adults were confused in the space. Children would instantly engage with it. It was wonderful. Wow. What piece of work. <laughs> and so uh, now I wondered what, what, because I know that now you you changed a little bit the trajectory of your journey. So yeah. I wonder what is uh, Martin's life now <laughs> and if there is connections with, with what you, you know, because you must have such a wealth of experience and insights into the children's life. I have a feeling that they cannot be, they can't go away. <laughs> so it's very hard to, yeah, they can't go away. You're absolutely right. I, uh, so they never leave my mind. I, I have become a farmer. I, you know, I, I, I now live on a farm. We have chickens and, uh, and we grow grapes, you know, so um, it's a very different life. But um, because I still want to stay connected with these ideas, we've been, um, We've been running uh, professional development days like we used to at the nursery, um, but for uh, visiting educators, we uh, in the spring, George, uh, Georgia Yapanis and I ran um, six sessions for, uh, for uh, visitors from Iceland and a few UK visitors as well, all around the, 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 uh, the project Mycelium Messages which Georgia had done with the children in, uh, in small school. Um, so that was, and that was very exciting. So we had a, you know, a, 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 a couple of hundred um, Icelandic visitors. And I think we'll carry on doing those. I'm also very, very tempted. I have to say it not, you know, not within earshot of the family, but I'm very tempted to make sure that we, I still connected to working with children. So I would love to have a, a small forest school here um, at the farm. We have five acres of woodland, we can, so we can work with that. And I think it would be really exciting to have children here again, um, or have children here. Um, and, and, and be, but be working and engaging with children and, and their ideas again. So that's something that we may do in future. But we're certainly still, uh, Georgia and I are still working with these ideas and we're, Potentially, we've got some plans to set something up together from September. Oh, this is really exciting. Yes, yeah, so yeah, really, yeah. really interesting to know more about that and be also involved in a way that because actually one of the first things I, I saw online about your life, present life, it was about this mycelium project yes. because as my listeners might know i'm very much into nature and, yes. and even even in reflection i think nature was a lot part of your mm, you know connections with the world isn't it it was it was it was always it, it was always important for us to ensure that children connected with nature and understood the rhythm of the seasons and so, so that's you know the forest school work that we did was hugely, hugely important. And when I finally sort of handed over the forest school work to 
the forest school team and they are fantastic we kate grant worked in the forest um and we had holly jally working in the forest uh beth scott and wonderful 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 team of people who did great great work with the children um they so we used to take 60 children into the forest every week for 40 weeks of the year um and they they really engaged with nature and they really understood that you know the power and the excitement of the seasons but what but what you noticed as well is that the the forest and the beach were hugely generative spaces for ideas and big big ideas would come back Mo you know, ideas of monsters ideas of trolls you know just the, you know these enormous powerful forces that they're connecting with in recognition that nature is powerful, they would bring those ideas back into the project work in the nursery. And that was really exciting. That was when nurse project work would go from indoors to outdoors, outdoors to indoors, and the ideas would just get bigger and more complex and more exciting. And I think that was, that was one of the biggest power, uh, biggest, most powerful things of forest school work for it. Um, yeah, so it's always been very important for us to, to engage with that. And we could see the evidence and the power of that in the project work itself. Yeah, because I can see that it's really important to have environmental choices in, you know, education. But when actually you put the focus on, on how you as a child, as an individual, live with nature, you grow up the respect from the inside, then yes. perhaps the environmental choices, which materials to use and all of that, it can come almost naturally because it comes from within. It comes yeah. part of you, who you are because you have lived with nature and learned that all these things are alive. And as you say, perceive these presence all yeah. around you then I, and i think a farm if it may be more than a school it's more even connected to nature because i mean we kind of have lost the seasonality of things for many for many things you know these days yeah. we buy all the food all the year round but yeah. it's somewhere you can see growing from non-existing you know level to when you yeah. can eat it or yeah. in a big scale in my definitely i can see a bigger impact uh, possible there yeah and i've i've sort of experienced that personally i mean i've always had a real sympathy for nature but literally now we live in the middle of nowhere we grow a lot of our own food we you know and we experience the we're always outdoors because we you know we have to be and in, in order to look after the farm and we really experience the closeness of nature and it's very very exciting and we wanted to try and give children as much of that as we could that was the you know that was the idea of the forest and the beach school and yeah it, it's when i i see the difference when people come down here from you know for a weekend or something from the city you know and they say oh my gosh you know and you know and how calm it is or how quiet it is and it's all but it's also how crazy it is you get wild wind you get you know wild animals we have deer running across the field you know it's it's exciting you know it's it's vibrant it's part of who we are as human beings yeah. yeah and i suppose the way we live in cities i think we need to retune ourselves i mean i live on the isle of wight and we are in unesco biosphere so yeah. you get this idea that when you live in nature, you have to learn to see and learn to hear and learn to, it's just a slightly different way and possibly even perception of time. I suppose yes. both things, you have to work with the perception of, perception of time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I wonder, because you mentioned to us a lot of names of interesting people, I like to sometimes ask my guests if they have anyone that they think would be really important for us to talk with or somebody we really shouldn't miss to interview in our podcast. Do you have any? I do, I do. So I, I don't know how busy these people are, but I, I'm going to offer you some lovely names because Deb Wilensky, you must talk to. She's now, I believe, working in Prague. Um, I, I met up with her in Reggio Emilia in the summer. Um, so we had we had dinner together in Reggio about a month ago. Um, and uh, Laura Maniavaki, who is originally from Reggio, but is now working in New Zealand. Uh, Laura was at our meeting, too, and we had dinner together. Um, so Laura and Deb are definitely two people I would I would love to hear you interview. I would love to see them on a podcast. Okay, great. 
but there are, you know, there are, I mean, there are some fantastic, I, I would, it's, it's, it seems unfair to just pick out those two people because we have so, because they were hugely influential, but so were many, many others. But um, I think, I think it's a good place to start with Deb and Laura, for sure. Okay, fantastic. And just one more question I wanted to ask. At the moment in the UK, do you know of any schools that are uh, follow the follow this Reggio Emilia approach? So, um there's a school in uh, Bath which uh, is inspired by Reggio uh, called Atelier. Um and there is also a nursery group in Horsham. Uh, that I've uh, and I know I know uh, Haley who who owns and runs it um, called Little Barn Owls, um, and she Haley's also started a school called Atelier Twenty One, uh, which is in Crawley, um, and that takes children all the way from you know uh, all the way from about eleven to uh, sixteen years old. Um, when we started our small school, uh, Haley would had lots of conversations about, you know, about starting a, a school. And we only took children up to the age of eight, but she's decided to continue with the approach, but going further. But you would have to talk to Haley about how much that is drawing from Reggio and how much she is, because they've already adopted the International Baccalaureate. For example, so but she's created a school of difference for sure. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, sa sadly, our small school closed down. Um, but for the time that we were working on it, it was the most exciting, I think, part of what we were doing because we were able to, to some degree, mirror the approach in Reggio even more closely by having children arrive from nine, leave at three. We had very small classes. We had two artists and a teacher and a teaching assistant working with the children. And they did three days of project work, one day in the forest and one day in the, at the beach, which as far as I'm concerned would be my ideal childhood if I, if I could have gone back to, to, have a, you know, to have my childhood again. But unfortunately, that's, that's no longer. They, um, the, the people who we sold the nursery to decided that that wasn't something they wanted to continue. But it was a very exciting project while it happened. But also that age, I suppose, from the potential of thinking, imagination, talking, communication, you know, making. Absolutely. So open and, and complex well, in a different way. Children start school so, so early in the UK. And we were always very envious that, that in Reggio they held on to children until they were five and six years old. So we really wanted that, which is one of the reasons we started the school. We, we, were, we were handing over these fantastically imaginative, creative children to schools, and I wanted to see what was next for them. So we started our own school partly because of that. Um, but of course, I don't, I'm sure you know that in Reggio at the Loris Malaguzzi Center, they also started a school um, many years ago, about five, seven, uh, seven years ago. I remember when it first started. And they had a hugely influential and brilliant pedagogista called Madalena Tedeschi in charge of, of making the school, making school age, uh, um, making the, the, the school age work for the Reggio approach or the Reggio approach work for school age. Um, and they take children up to 13. And the last time I visited the school, which was, I think, 2017, it was exceptional. It was fascinating. It was amazing. It was exciting and a really different approach to, to school and probably, you know, nothing like anything else in, in Italy at all. Oh, wow. I, I love to look it up. <laughs> yeah. Look at Madalena Tedeschi as well. She's, she's, um, uh, I, I have huge admiration. It's cool. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Martin. It was really so interesting to talk to you about all of these things. And I'm really, really excited to see what, what is going to be next. Thank and, you. That's great. And I wonder where people can find out about this next 
projects or possibilities from so we so um, georgia and i will put something together shortly and then we'll we'll put it on social media and and but I will also let you know, Lucia, and then you can tell tell other people about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll sure I'll make it into the put it in the show notes. Fantastic. Hey, okay. thank you. Thank much. you so much. It's, it was a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. This conversation was so deep, rich, and inspiring that it left me with a heart full of renewed energy as an artist that works with children. And what I loved the most was the example that Martin is, of when and how theory can meet practice. Of course, through dedication, but with the key element that keeps any project alive, which is wonder. And I truly hope to experience what he still holds for young people, and maybe for young at heart, like me. I will link in the show notes all the people and places that Martin had shared with us. And don't forget, we also have a YouTube version if you prefer to watch the interview. And if you happen to know any little creatives, I have started a Patreon for children where they can enjoy in a safe space the magic of nature and art to shape a life full of imagination and possibilities. Thanks for listening. Until next time, keep creating.